More on these stories at townhall.com. The following is an American Matters Media production. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the station or its advertisers, although we think they should. But that's the opinion of America Matters Media. Hello and welcome to Talking Truth to Power, Nevada's Freedom Talk Radio. I'm Jennifer Green, my co-host Brendan Trainer and Lena Fegri are here live in the American Matters Media Studio in the seasonally decorated Reno Town Hall. How are you doing? Yeah, very festive. Yeah, it is very festive. I, I haven't seen Santa Claus yet, but it looks like they're awaiting his appearance. <laughs> anyone, any one of these tips now. <laughs> All right, so um, as usual, there's a lot to talk about today. I'm glad both of you guys made it through this week of snow. It was an interesting week out there on the roads, for sure. Yeah. Did you get some of the snow up there in the, at the lake? We never saw the sun yesterday. Yeah, we did it down here. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty interesting because the lake did see the sun, but that's all kind of down. You know, right. Time, so. And when I left this morning, it was uh, 26, 27, and when the lake level was... 21, I think. Is it all cloudy up there again today? Uh, not much uh, at, at the lake itself, but I'll tell you, when we came down um, Highway 50, there was a, an ocean of cloud mm. cover. And it's about, it, it looked to be about uh, a couple hundred feet of clouds. It's yeah. Beautiful. It's really something. And that's what I've heard that we're in an inversion. So that's yeah. why it's so cold yeah. and cloudy mm. down here. Mm. All right, so uh, we can, let's. Shove off into the news here. So, um, some big headlines that came up this past week are the passing of President Bush, Bush 41, and that's obviously a, a big deal. Um, what do you guys, what's your take on that? Do you want to delve into the uh, Bush legacy? Well, I'll step into this. Uh, the, the first thing is the timeline about all of the coverage that I saw, and I didn't see it all, but there was never any mention of press doctors. Mm -hmm. Never mm -hmm. one. Yeah, so why don't you educate our listeners? Well, the controversy over Prescott Bush goes back to the Second World War and, and the fact that he was not only a banker, but also a munitions, had, had a role in the munitions industry. So the government came in and shut him down. And of course, that, that does cast him a, a favorable light on the deep festivities, and so mm -hmm. it, uh, it didn't come up. But it certainly is an extraordinary part of Bush's legacy. Yes, I mean, weren't there, uh, they were, there were some collusion with the Germans with the Nazis yeah. going on. They were mm -hmm. helping supply some of the uh, Nazi interests. Mm -hmm. It yeah. is amazing that with that legacy, they still managed to become the political powerhouse that that family became. Yeah, except for the fact that the same people who write the coverages and, and history of the, of the epic of the period in which they, they went, they went, they all went through, they are the same people that were covering up for his involvement in it. So. It, it kind of highlights that fact, doesn't it? Sure, sure yeah. Well, uh, my take is that, you know, after watching the media uh, coverage, I can understand uh, that they believe the only good Republican is a dead Republican. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're quoting somebody, aren't you? Yeah, probably, yes. <laughs> no, you probably heard it somewhere uh, in the news this week, yeah, but uh, so, but that, and, you know, as far as Bush himself, Bush 41, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag uh, for us uh, as freedom lovers. I mean, he did set a good tone and he did manage the uh, end of communism fairly well. But that was a script of the end. I mean, how, how difficult would that have been? Yeah. Well, I mean, he went to, um, it was pretty difficult because he was the last president that actually had real realists in the foreign policy establishment. People like Brent Stokrop and especially James Baker. Well, there's all CFR. I mean, these are all establishment types. Well, well they are, right? but they, they did yeah. a fairly good job in some aspects. And uh, one of them was, I mean, he went to Kiev and gave a speech that the neocons jumped on and called it Chicken Kiev. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> because he said that, you know, in his opinion, Russia should stay together, but perhaps give their different provinces more autonomy. And he warned against ethnic, uh, you know, uprisings if they didn't, which came true in many, many of the uh, former uh, territories of the USSR. And so in that sense, he was, he was okay, and he didn't rape Russia, Clinton raped Russia. You know, Clinton was the one that sent in the, uh, the Lawrence Summers and 
and the Bill Browders and then all the rest of them that uh, raped Russia during the Yeltsin years and stole so much of its property and uh, caused a five-year loss of uh, life expectancy among the Russian people. And the Russian people consider the 1990s as one of the worst periods in their entire history. Yeah, well, the, the infrastructure was all GEU and the highway system was all Western, and so there was a good opportunity for Western industrial interests to come in, right? and it slowed the fact that the wall had come down, which I'm convinced was their organization. They designed that, so they could take advantage of the situation like that. I mean, that wall was there to come down in. So I don't get forced credit. I will get forced credit for one thing, and that is Clarence Thomas. There you go. Okay. okay. One thing. All right. Uh, well, at least we have Bush one and Romans <laughs> 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 well, 99 or something. I mean, well, yeah. he, was, he was a member of the Trilateral Commission, which was the big thing in the 80s, and he did preside over the savings and loan fiasco and the... Uh, as did John McCain. As did John McCain and the bailout of Mexico, and um, although that was, you know, uh, Greenspan's primary deal, mm -hmm. but still. Um, he was also a CFR. Yeah, and he also um, had this thing about uh, ending the Vietnam syndrome, and he did it by uh, in, uh, going at the pineapple face in Panama, you yeah. know, Noriega. Yeah, yeah, he knew all the bodies were there. You know, yeah. Noriega. Yep. And uh, so, and uh, I'm not saying that he was the greatest thing, but uh, I mean, he was, like I said, he. James Baker was a fairly good Secretary of State. I like to listen to him. I thought he was. Uh, oh, he was eloquent. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, they did push back on Israel and the settlement. Uh, after they won the Gulf War, I know they tried to get use their political capital from winning that war uh, to uh, halt the Israeli settlements, although they didn't back it up with a whole lot of, you know, real-world consequences if they didn't do it. They just threatened to cut off their aid and all that. Well, in the Gulf War, you know, we did send in troops into the Gulf War, got us involved in Iraq, but then we also... Without a declaration of war. Without a right. declaration of war, um, at least we didn't stay in Iraq. They actually got people out of there, for the most part. Right and then he, he encouraged the March people... The and he encouraged the March people to rebel, the Shia in southern Iraq, and they were, you know, slaughtered by Saddam Hussein and... Yeah, it was a mixed bag, totally. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Well, you think you're going back to Noriega again. Well, hold that thought, man. Mm -hmm. We will uh, oh. be back right after the break. <laughs> the Read and Succeed book program needs your help. They're looking for volunteers. Stop by and see us. Visit us at Lancaster Auto Care or call us at 775-813-2276. And remember, we give discounts to our active military and veterans. Lancaster Auto Care, in their new state-of-the-art location, 56 Coney Island Drive, just one block west of the intersection of Greg and McCarran. This is America Matters Media on AM 1180, KCKQ, a Lotus Broadcast Station, the power of the radio since 1967. Want to expand your advertising dollar? Sponsor this or any America Matters program by calling 775 827-8900, extension 2. Hello and welcome back to Talking Truth to Power, Arena's Freedom Talk Radio. Uh, my name is Brendan Drano, a award winning writer here in Northern Nevada. My co-hosts are Jennifer Sturgeon and Leland Davey. And we're here every Friday from 9 to 10 a.m. on 1180 a.m. America Matters Media. And we stream live at www.americamatters.us. You can call in at 844-790-TALK. And so we were talking about uh, the passing of uh, Bush 41, and uh, we were, uh, you know, I'm taking a little more nuanced view in that I think he did some things well, but he did a lot of things not so well. <laughs> yeah, we were deciding he was a, a mixed bag, and uh, my, I was telling you guys on, over the break, my biggest remembrance of Bush is that he was, He's the first president I actually personally remember, um, and I remember the Gulf War, and I distinctly remember when he said that because he was the president, he didn't have to eat broccoli unless he wanted to. Yes. And I remember because I'll, I was in the first grade, and I remember everybody was kind of like, all the kids were like, wow, so if you're president, you don't have to eat broccoli. So then it was, everybody wanted to be the president, and they asked, what do you want to be? <laughs> the president became popular because of that. Um, 
I don't know though. I was kind of thinking if, if Barbara told them to keep walking, I bet you still would. I wouldn't want to cross Barbara. I don't know about him, but I don't think I'd ever want to cross Barbara. I think she was the hammer. She wore the pants in the family. I think so. I think yeah. her too. And uh, you famous for the uh, read my lips, no new taxes. All right. <laughs> because it, uh, did not. That he broke. That yes. Promise. He did. And I think that hurt him a lot in re-election. Oh, it did. Yeah. 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 Yes, it did. They replayed that over and over again. <laughs> and Ross Perot was convinced that he was going to uh, kidnap his daughter or break up her wedding somehow, oh. send in the Secret Service. And I, there are a lot of rumors about Ross Perot's family getting threatened. I well, don't it, know. It was George Herbert Walker Bush that seconded the promotion for Perot's membership in the Council on Family Life. But Perot never had, uh, never joined. Never joined. But who was? But they were trying to get him. What drafted into it? Who was? But who was? Well, who they, they, they tried to bring him in. You know, I see. To, uh, sort of uh, sway the situation. Bring you into the fold. In the fold. Yeah, they want him. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the team. <laughs> <laughs> Perot wasn't part of the team. Right. Right. And uh, yeah. neither was Trump. I just have this great quote here from George Bush uh, going back to the Persian Gulf crisis. He says, this is from him, on September 11th of 1990, the Persian Gulf crisis is a rare opportunity to forge new bonds with, the, with old enemies. The Soviet Union, out of these troubled times, a new world order can merge into a United Nations that performs a, a as envisioned by its founders. Ah, so that's the that was for the reason. That was the thing for the, the Persian Gulf Club. We're and we're in a new world order. And within two hours, Prince Stokoff used that expression hmm. of the invasion. Within two hours of the invasion. So that was what, a new world order. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's true. But um, I mean, it it was a new world order. But like I said, Clinton was the one that pushed it to the max that America is a, a superpower now and we can do whatever we want in the world. And, and like I said, he, Clinton is primarily responsible for teaming up with Boris Yeltsin, uh, who was ill and, uh, and uh, drunk half the time, and um, to rape Russia. And, uh, Russia. and we're still feeling the consequences of, of that because it was Vladimir Putin who was elected in 2000 who uh, restored Russia to its current status as our great adversary. The new Hitler. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, uh, you know it, 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 and speaking of the Clintons, I mean, when Russia intervened in Syria, that was the first time since World War II that non-U.S. Uh, fighter planes were involved in a, a situation that was against our so-called U.S. interests. And that's why Hillary Clinton was calling, kept calling for, uh, you know, a no-fly zone because that that had been our typical response from the fan. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but it didn't work that way because Russia was too strong and they, they couldn't do it. And now we have a continuation of this. And um, you know, re reports are coming out that Russia is getting fed, fed up with Donald too. I don't know. This is a little off topic from Bridge 41, but uh, yeah, reports are that. Um, after Trump snubbed uh, Putin, uh, be, you know, Russia was, the first two years, was willing to say that Donald Trump would be different. And when he was elected, they toasted champagne in the Kremlin. And that uh, he would, uh, you know, bring uh, better relations between the U.S. and Russia. But now after he's been snubbed, uh, Putin was snubbed at, in Paris. And then in a couple of days before the supposed meeting in Argentina, Trump said a tweet because of that minor border problem in, in the Sea of Azov and uh, with Ukraine. And uh, I think Russia is saying, you know, even if Clinton had been elected, at least we would have known what she was about. With well, Trump in there, we don't know. It's hot one day, cold the next. Mm -hmm. He's extremely right. erratic. Yes. I can, I, it, he does seem to be very erratic and it sort of changes from day to day. And he's, I feel like, um, he tends to be too swept up in that vortex that is Washington, D.C. and the Beltway and these stories that get going in there about Russia and he put all this pressure on him to not be friends with Russia oh, absolutely. And, and that Russia should be our enemy. I don't believe they should be. I, I think, you know, it needs to keep a clear vision of the fact that, you know, we're going to have uh, peace through friendship. And right. There's nothing wrong with friendship. That's not 
treasonous Not in any way. That's his job. And that's his job, and that's a, it's a good policy. It's a good policy for the country. It's good for good for him, but it's good for the country. It's good for the American people. It doesn't. The journalists and that slowly vortex of the the oh this investigation and this collusion and all those words that the journalists throw around constantly about Russia you need to kind of be above that because it is just them fomenting, trying to, you know, whatever they, they're doing, that they've been doing about Trump. Since he got into office, they still haven't stopped. They're still trying to find things to nail him with. And he just needs to focus on what's good for the country. Which is and, what he's doing. Yeah, and make that clear in his policy speeches and stay the course and not, like you said, be erratic. Because he is going to fork off Russia or the Chinese or whoever and just, you know, he needs to uh, focus on the policy, what's good for the country and articulate that clearly. But obviously, you know, if you did all that, you probably wouldn't be gone. Well, so. yeah, yeah, that's true. But, um, and hopefully the spirit of what he's about will last longer than his presidency and somebody else will pick up the mantle. And that's the big question. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, he said, he keeps saying, you know, he wants us out of Afghanistan, but then he turns around and said, well, all the experts say we have to stay in there. And so, no, Matt is also, also committed to leaving Afghanistan. Yeah. Now, how that happen? Right, I, I'd like to see that happen. I, I hope I live to see today. But before we leave Bush, uh, I'd like to revert back to the, the Noriega episode, because I'm convinced that he was going to spill the beans on, on the drug trafficking in the region, right. which is why they were after him. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 But because uh, he's been linked to Clinton and the drug trade in America. Mm -hmm. And I have an autographed book called Compromise by a, pi a pilot named Harry Reid who said the Bush family was involved in it. And, you know, there's even a book out called The Bush Crime Family. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? And so this was not the press conference. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which we wasn't mentioned this week. <laughs> well, that's why we were mentioning it. But, but I want to go back to that because they were all members of the Skull and Bone Society. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. That's right. Right. And that's a very interesting membership because there's only 15 of those people selected every year. Mm -hmm. And in 2004, guess what? We had presidential candidate uh, Democrat Kerry and presidential candidate Republican George Walker Bush, and they were both members of the Skull and Bone Society of Yale. Mm -hmm. Now, as a prerequisite for membership, apparently you're supposed to lie naked in one of those coffins and uh, confess your sexual history as a condition for members of the Skull and Bone Society. Uh, and they also, Who knows what else? and they also, claim, yeah, that's this is what we hear about. Anyway. Right. But uh, uh, there's also a condition. Look, there's apparently a membership uh, model or a, a bone of Geronimo that are part of the uh, I think so, secret, yeah. secret uh, mm -hmm. characteristics of the organization. Mm -hmm. So really peculiar stuff. I can't imagine ever being persuaded to do anything like that for any purpose. No, there's uh, actually, I believe. It's some copycat societies around. I know UNR has one called Coffins and Keys. <laughs> Something along those lines. And they do some similar stuff. Yeah, but I, they don't get elected president. They do not. <laughs> They're not. It's not you. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, and, and there's a lot of, of this uh, deep bush, you know, stuff going around that we just don't know exactly what's going on. But as far as uh, the invasion of uh, Kuwait again, I mean, the, uh, a woman came and testified before Congress that the Iraqis were uh, dumping babies out of incubators in mm -hmm. hospitals in Kuwait. And, and that's not to be true. Yeah, it's not to be true. And it, it's almost the same story that the British used against the Germans in World War I. When, I was going yeah. say, yeah. Yeah, the Germans were babies. supposed to be bayoneting babies right. in Belgium. And I, she, think, I think what has come out recently with the steel, with the dossier, the steel dossier, is that the British intelligence is, is just hand and glove with the United States. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no question about how close they are, and, and Trump has even suggested that one of the reasons we have to release the, um, the intelligence on this episode is because uh, he wants to see what protect the uh, British intelligence, the source or something. Like that. <laughs> and for him to say that, yeah, um, it's just so revealing. Yeah, you wonder is it hand and glove or is that control? I, I you know, who knows what exactly. Well, London is still, <laughs> but, well, you know, London is rivals New York City as the financial capital of the world. And, Absolutely. And uh, that's uh, and Zurich, and that's where the, uh, the international bankers meet, and uh, and it's the source of the CFR, the, yeah. the Royal Institute of International Affairs. Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean, uh, I'm no friend of the English uh, elites <laughs> myself. No, they are no friend of the United States. No, no not sure. really. No, <laughs> never happened. No, <laughs> I think you're still upset about losing the colonies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, this is talking to the power. We're coming up on the bottom of the hour break, and we will be back right, right after this. Come to Candelaria's today. Carry out and delivery is also available. Just call 449-5502 to place your order today. This is America Matters Media on AM 1180 KCKQ, a Lotus Broadcast Station, the power of radio since 1967. Unable to listen to the whole show? A recording of today's program will be available later today. Visit americamatters.us and click on the podcast link. And yes, please do that. We would uh, love to have everybody that can tune in and hear our show. I think that we have a very unique show and bring some unique perspective to the, the uh, world events. Look at the phones light up. <laughs> <laughs> this is Talking to the Power and Jennifer Green, my co-host is Brendan Trainer and Leland Fagre. Before we go back to our very uh, interesting discussion, I would like to give a shout out to our sponsor, Reno Computer Services, a locally owned and operated computer business. Anything you need done for your computer, if you're having uh, problems that need to be backed up or fixed or set up, they, they do set up for businesses, stuff like that, you can give these guys a call. 775-737-4400. Again, that's Reno Computer Services. They have a great online presence, of course. They do all things IT, so you can find them online at renocomputerservices.com. Again, that's renocomputerservices.com. And they are right down the street. They are very close by. Yeah, I didn't get to them last week because whatever happened last week, I and mean, I were talking about this before the show. Uh, repair itself, fix itself. So. Sometimes that happens, but yes, they're right down the street at 500 Ryland, Street 200. Right. So shout out to those guys, we really appreciate their sponsorship. Well, here's the quote that should have been widely shared with the size mass media, whatever the source, and it is from President George Bush, Sir Walker Bush, addressing the General Assembly of the United Nations on the 1st of February 1992. It is the sacred principles enshrined in the United Nations Charter to which the American people will henceforth pledge their allegiance. Hmm. Hold the phone, people. <laughs> <laughs> what yeah. about that? Yeah, the UN Charter is full of things are called human rights, which are very vague. Very and, vague. Yes. And it encompasses things mm -hmm. where, such as education and health care and all that. So that's. Well, yeah. But that isn't his, what, the, the deeper meaning here is that he was committed to global, he was committed to the United Nations authority on this planet. Well, absolutely. And, and Not the Constitution. Right, no, going to that point, as you say, at the uh, National Rotunda of the National Archives, they have, it's like it's a progression, they have the Declaration of Independence, they have the Constitution, then they have the United Nations Bill of Rights. All there on our mm -hmm. rotund national the archive. Yeah. Yeah. Like it is a natural progression. And we were talking about Bush was a you know World War II generation, and there was there was rhetoric at that time about we were bringing a new world order, and that's after that that the United Nations finally got together. You know they tried to do it after World War One, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right? And it didn't quite take because the uh, the United States did not join. Charles Lindbergh Senior killed it. Well, it, right, and then after World War II, they managed to pressure it in. And um, George Bush was definitely part of that generation and uh, bringing in the New World Order to this country. And isn't it interesting that just happened to have a, a someone film his, uh, he came up out of the water and, and went to the shot down, you know? Oh. And he just happened to have a camera there for that? Really? Yeah. Like, like Kennedy? What are the odds? <laughs> If you want to know. <laughs> right. is, this, is this formulaic? I mean, uh, why do I feel like Alex Jones here? <laughs> we, were, we were talking about Alex Jones uh, over the break because uh, uh, Brendan was mentioning Alex Jones and the... Uh, uh, Bohemian uh, Grove. Right, where they worship the owl. Yeah. Right. They haven't had a camera as they told him aboard. I mean, it's the odds are absolutely up now. Well, that's when they first had embedded journalists. Was World War II, I I don't know, right? I mean, how, how deep does the rabbit hole go? <laughs> it sure worked for him, though, for his entire <laughs> political career. Well, he was, and if he approaches the town, he looks up at it. Remember that? Have you seen it? I, you know, I'd have to go back and look, yeah. but I think it's been a while. 
<laughs> yeah. Interesting. And, and you know, the Gulf, another thing about the Gulf War was the first uh, responsibility to protect war. I think I found one thing. I didn't even realize. Oh, okay. I just told you know, and, and uh, Bush uh, said that because um, Saddam Hussein uh, invaded the sovereignty of, of Kuwait, that uh, America had to respond to protect the sovereignty. But it shall not stand. Yes, exactly. Hmm. And uh, a lot of people, uh, there were some good people here in Reno that were predicting that it would be a, a slug, a slough, you know, it would be a, a difficult war. And they uh, were proven wrong, and they kind of hurt the anti-war movement because it was so easy. It was mm -hmm. like, I mean, uh, Saddam Hussein just left his, uh, did exactly what the Russians would probably have told him not to do, and that he launched his whole air force on the first day, and they were all wiped out. And then he, uh, his troops retreated in these long columns across the open desert where they were sitting ducks, and they were sitting. Yeah, exactly. It, one thing that kind of strikes me thinking about thinking about how it was during the Gulf War, I remember there what seemed like one thing that it strikes me is different from now. We have so many troops around the world now and there's ongoing conflict. And then during the Gulf War that was kind of like, okay, we're we're now in a war. And remember there were yellow ribbons everywhere? I remember somebody put a yellow ribbon all the way around the city of mm -hmm. Reno and it was kind of like we were all thinking about our troops and pulling for our troops and it was a big deal, and that's so different from now, where we have these wars of attrition that see, we have soldiers all over, and we don't see the cure, like Afghanistan. We don't even hear about it unless somebody dies. We're not, it's not on people's minds. Well, they're right. undeclared, all these conflicts are undeclared. Yeah. And we have, we incentivize um, going into the military, kids coming right out of high school, and they get their education there, and the GI right. Bill. And, so everything is upside down here. I mean, it shouldn't be that uh, attractive to go into the military. Right. It's really a job program where you yeah. go overseas and kill, mm -hmm. uh, and for the benefits, you know. And it's it's sad because they're also cannon fodder. But uh, yes. you know, we don't see as many people coming back with IED injuries because. We were totally unprepared for counterinsurgency where the army, at, when we got involved in these wars, was an attack army. And so uh, we had uh, retrofitted Humvees that were blown up quite easily, people getting, you know, uh, serious brain damage and losing limbs. You don't see that as much now because of the fact that finally after 10 years or 15 years, they develop good IED uh, containment vehicles. Mm -hmm. yeah. several, uh, several models, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I I kind of think, for me, looking back on Bush, that that is a, a stain on his legacy that he was the, he's the president that really got us started military in, intervention into the Middle East, yeah, we which we it. have not stopped. That's since. right, we haven't left. Not really. I mean, we did bring the troops home, but and I what, think that set up George W. Well, and Osama bin Laden. Right. 9 11. I mean, he, right. you know, his point was that when we uh, set up our air bases there, that was it. Right. They had to declare war on us. Yeah. Right. So, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, on a brighter note, do you want to uh, go over to France, where uh, one of those globalist elites is getting a club kid? <laughs> Yes, 18 percent now. Uh, not growing <laughs> the popularity. Yeah. yeah, interesting. And uh, yeah, so there's uh, ongoing riots in France, and you know they they do riots like nowhere else <laughs> in France. Um, it's so that old revolutionary spirit. That it is. It makes me think of uh, bring out the guillotine. Right. <laughs> exactly. I was thinking maybe I should read a tale of two cities again. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, the, uh, the it started with a riot against a raise in fuel taxes. There's more taxes, more taxes over there all the time. And they're calling these the, the yellow vests. So apparently people in France are required by law to carry those the bright uh, reflected yellow vests. Yeah. Here. So if you have to break down on the side of the road, people can see you. Mm -hmm. And so... Isn't it ironic that they, they created a uniform for these people? They did. <laughs> and I saw, I saw a yellow vest, someone was wearing it, and they'd written on the back, no new taxes. And I could even read it even though it was in French. And they're calling for Trump. On the I ground, on the streets. Wow. They're calling for Trump there, and they're calling for Trump in two points. Huh? Well, it's a it's an interesting group. So 
the people, a lot, they were saying that a lot of these folks who are wearing yellow vests and are upset are people who commute because they're upset about the raise, you know, the rise in uh, fuel taxes. So they're people with cars. I heard someone saying sarcastically, these are people who have their whole life revolved around their car. <laughs> yeah, and so well, not, not and the it, city it, dwellers so yeah, much. Yeah, well, France is like Reno in that we have McLaren Boulevard that goes all the way around the city and yeah. France has a circular yeah. like uh, ring around the city and those who live inside that ring, uh, you know, there, there, there isn't a whole lot of traffic problems. There's very good public transportation and Uber and everything else to get around in. But uh, if, if you're uh, commuting, I mean, I was caught in the, in the traffic from Charles de Gaulle Airport to, to, to the uh, inner Paris and it's rough and it's it's as bad as anything in, in, the, in New York City or Moscow. It is really a, a terrible commute, and these are working people. These are the ones that provide the basic jobs that make life easier for the wealthier people that live within the ring. There you go. Yeah. But and keep so, in mind that this, this, is, this tax is a repudiation. This, this movement is a repudiation. It's not about the fuel tax as such. It's going for the uh, climate chaos. Yes. It just yeah, it just started with that tax, and now I guess it's, the protests have spread to multiple multiple things. And now, yeah, there's, there's plenty of protests on the horizon. Yeah, they're not happy with not well, globalism is dead in Europe. It's just dawning on them. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not going to work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, uh, Frau Merkel uh, was formally replaced as the head of the uh, social. I think it's the Social Democrat Party that she was head of. Yes. And, yes, uh, she's stepping down. Yes, and, exactly. and, and an era is ending. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Frau Merkel. I love that. that would be <laughs> and um, you know, I, I would call the World War One uh, ceremony that Trump didn't go to. <laughs> in which they uh, anointed themselves as the keeper of the flame of World War I and the preserver of the peace. They had this big, you know, they had this round table meeting, they had... The war to end all wars. Yeah. So sad. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they were giving each other congratulations on, on you know... <laughs> on keeping the peace, though, yeah. when their world war broke out again. Yes. 15 years after that, but never got <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we are coming up on a uh, final break. This is show is going by fast. This is Talking Truth to Power. We will be back right after this. Hi, I'm Doreen Leary, CEO of the Bay. Saturdays, 10 to noon, here on American Now. To join the conversation, call 844-790-TALK. That's 844-790-8255. Now, back to the show. Hello, and welcome back to Talking to the Power. This is Brendan Craney, your co-host with Jennifer Perhune Green, <laughs> and Leland Fagri. And um, I'm sorry that I missed, missed that, Jennifer, but uh, we are all winding up here down the final segment. We've still got a lot we could talk about. Um, did you want to talk about uh, the uh, vote? Uh, uh, against uh, MBS in, in the Senate? Yes, let's do that. I just wanted to add a footnote to, so I have to get a whole bunch of paperwork together to formally change my name, because unless the government agencies say so, uh -huh. I haven't changed my name officially, and that kind of forced me off, because I can able to say what my name is. Why does yeah. the government have to say what my name is? But I have to have all the I's and cross all the T's and fill out all the forms and kind of aggravate. Well, do you want to go to Exactly, right? That's all where it starts. Yeah. We, we were speaking about the draft, and uh, as I've mentioned a couple of times, I resisted the draft in the world in the, the Vietnam War, and it was kind of underground in the uh, New York and the war community, and for several years, and I never used my real name. <laughs> I, yeah, I mean, I just made up the name that uh, nickname that my girl, one of my girlfriends gave me, and went with that. Well, my name, my main girlfriend. Hey, don't get him. Don't get him, No. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, you know, it can be done. People can do it, but uh, I've, I've done with it since then. <laughs> well, I guess there's a very large community of guys still living in Canada. Yeah, probably are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're uh, right across the, a uh, patient was telling me about this, right across the border, I think it's in Blaine. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a pretty large population of uh, draft doctors up there, so mm -hmm. still hiding out. That's kind of sad. Well, you know, when I was in high school, we actually got out of our seats and 
sat on the floor and played out of a, out of a box, a game, which uh, replicated the Vietnam conflict. There were superpowers on both sides. Uh, and at that point, at that point in time, we've gone to lot of so, Which state were you in? Like California. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they had a, um, my dad was up there in Washington State, and they had a lottery, and they had an exemption to use the college, and uh, they took away the exemption, and had a lottery, and they picked a very high number, which I guess my grandmother was so happy to try. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the box game, effectively, was a proxy game. Mm -hmm. legitimize the, the conflict that we were experiencing, which is without declaration of war. Right. So it was a worthless experience. You know, it was a sham of an education. I remember you know, that particular episode in my senior year in high school. Hmm. And that leads us to public education, which we... Yes, we've been, we've been, we've been discussing for a while that we okay. want to do a uh, calamity of the week. Uh, what's going on in public education? This is a topic near and dear to Leland's heart. Well, it, it is. I, I really uh, am on the one man crusade against the public education. But, uh, I'll, I'll no, wait a minute. We're, we're one part of it. You're with us? Yes. No, I'm the one man. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> there was uh, recently, just to bring it up to date, there was a grad queen uh, invited to a middle school in Colorado, where else was Colorado. Uh, on a sort of a vocational appreciation day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, but yesterday, or the day before, I heard, because um, there's one, there's one of these, there's, there's so many of these examples. Uh, they, I, they, there's a teacher, I believe on the East Coast, who will, uh, will not allow uh, sugar canes, uh, yeah. Christmas sugar canes, mm -hmm. to be distributed because uh, it gives me the letter of a J. And? J for... J for... Jesus? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> no, it was, no, no, it's it complete contrivance, but this is how these people think. <laughs> yeah. We, we might be offending somebody these, somewhere. These adults <laughs> are educating your children. <laughs> it has some religious significance. It was supposed to be a, a, a shepherd's crook. Well, it depends on who you talk to, I'm sure, Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, the whole, so much of what we celebrate as Christmas is, has nothing to do with Christ. I believe that, that the, that's basically a repurposed holiday. It was a winter festival. That's why we have all the, the greenery and the, that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's Santa Claus. It's the pagan tradition. Right. It's the feast and the uh, bringing the, the uh, pine tree inside right, the house. Right, the pine, the greenery. The, the Yule log, all yeah. of that stuff. Yes, None of that yes. has anything to do with Christianity. But there anymore. was a Saint Nicholas. There was a Saint. Well, yes, but I'm sure he was around before the Catholic Church decided to call him Saint So and So. Well, yeah, of course, he was a bishop in Greece, and he was known for his, he was a he had been a wealthy businessman, but he was known for his philanthropy, and he used to go around and put little uh, sums of money or gifts into the. Uh, in those days, uh, shoes, because people didn't wear socks before. So he would go around to the floor and put stuff in their shoes, and that's, that's where we get a lot of the, you know, yeah. Jolly St. Nicholas. Although Jolly St. Nicholas is more Swedish than, than even yeah. uh, Greek. There's yeah. a lot of Swedish, there's a lot of uh, uh, Scandinavian and German traditions that mm -hmm. we have sort of mashed together and into what we call Christmas. Mm -hmm. I really do think it's, for the most part, a repurposing of a holiday that was already in, in existence. Like, oh, it was co-opted. It was co-opted by yeah. the church. Well, that's what the and Catholics do. And that's what the Catholics do. Yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah I mean, you, Wherever you, they you, go. you can even argue the concept <laughs> of the Trinity is a, a form of uh, incorporating pagan, uh, you know, multi multitude of gods. Yeah, there used to be yeah. thousands of gods, and yeah. they would use it too. Yeah. Well, but you have all the saints, and people pray to the saints, and, yeah. and I think a lot of that. So, yeah, so, <laughs> so I think to, to try to say that the, the candy cane is a J for Jesus is No, ridiculous. no, that is ridiculous. No, that no. is ridiculous. And, um, yeah. So take your kids out of those uh, those institutions, folks, and let's start this movement today. Oh, I, I think actually that's a very significant movement. I mean, I know I was homeschooled for, um, I'd say, the second half of my education growing up, and there were a number of resources out there about for homeschooling, but there are so many more now. Oh, yeah. And I think it's a much more common, accepted thing. I mean, when we were doing it, it's kind of like, you're what? Who? You do what? Isn't that backwards? 
and we kind of got some pushback on and that. The socialization, right? And all that. All that. We got a lot of you know, family yeah. were upset. We had you know, it's the socialization that's your body. Right. And that's what that's, that's, right? that's, that's what the damage is. That's what we don't want. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I, I feel like it is a growing thing. It's definitely not a one-man movement. You know, a lot of us, and the numbers show that.